Good morning. Today's uh, great date is uh, Resident Research Day. Uh, the weather is with us because if we had done this last week, we wouldn't be here. So whoever picked this a year in advance did a great job. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Casey Eichelberger. Um, she is visiting us from uh, Prisma Health in South Carolina. She's the chair of the OBGYN department. Uh, she trained the medical school in uh, the, at the University of South Carolina and then moved a little bit up north to North Carolina <laughs> to the, the residency with our own Lisa um, and then stay there for a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine. Um, and since then has done amazing things back down to South Carolina. Uh, she uh, has done... Uh, she's a principal investigator for the MFMU, which is sort of the largest uh, network for research, and that is in itself a full-time job, but she also, as you could see through all her career, has a big uh, uh, motivation for uh, caring for the ones uh, in need and uh, seeing those efforts. She has um, directed or uh, created the Magdalene Clinic, which uh, takes care of uh, trauma-informed care for pregnant women with substance abuse. Um, she has multiple grants for that, and we are so thrilled to have you here this morning to talk to us about that. Please. Good morning. It is delightful to be with you. And what Igor didn't share is that he and I were actually in the SMFM Leadership Academy together and so got to intersect about six years ago and spent, or seven years ago now, um, good time developing understanding of our own bias, our own leadership talents and gifts and reactive tendencies, and just had a really wonderful time together during that. So a lot of fun to be back with you. Um, would those four of you who are presenting your research today be willing to raise your hand just so I know where you're sitting? Good morning. So you are, are wait, that's two. They're, they're in that parking lot line. Okay, wonderful. So I just want to honor you this morning. So I'm essentially just your warm up act, right? That's what this is. And I also, in thinking about you this morning, thought, huh, it is probable that they are very anxious this morning. They had three buddies who were able to present last week and get it done. I remember done being a really good feeling for resident research. And then you had this lingering week of having to worry about presenting. And then right now, um, Dr. Gross preparing to come right behind me. So just want to honor that this morning and say that I remember Dr. Barra Letts resident research project many years ago. I had the privilege of sitting in the room and watching her present. And then I wanted to share a story from my own resident research day just by saying it's all going to be fine and everyone in the room is cheering for you. So our year, we followed Dr. Barrelet's class, and um, we were all dressed as mini bankers in that tradition of medicine where we all put on coats and look oddly like we're in the finance world, although we are in medicine. We were nervous. We were many things in my class, but researchers we were not at the time, and certainly public speakers we were not. So the entire thing felt very anathema to our natu natural skill sets. There's one guy in our class who will go unnamed, but who had the bright idea that we were going to do group beta blockers together that morning. And all of us were not at our optimal weight. We were underweight because we were working a lot at the time. And he somehow had snagged a handful of beta blockers. And I'm hoping statute of limitations is gone by now and I can say this, but so we just popped them that morning. We thought this is going to be a good strategy, which it was for a while until the tech went down in the room and they said, we're going to have to shift across campus to this other auditorium and we're changing the timeline. And we were all like, oh gosh, right? So if right now everything went down in Wisconsin and we had to move and we we're going to do it this afternoon, I imagine Dr. Gross is like, oh, that feels awful. I've been, I'm ready. This has got to end. And somehow in that process, he decides that the the you know circulating volume of our labetalol at that time was not sufficient to help us and that we needed to redose ourselves 
So he passes out another six pills and we all pop those six pills. And my memory of walking up to present is that the entire world was slow-mo. If there's such a thing as malignant bradycardia, I had it that day. It was all very muddled in my mind. So you're going to do fine. Don't worry about it. All right. Delighted to be with you this morning. Um, I wanted to take a very brief moment to give a word to those of you that were not with us at SMFM a few weeks ago. So if anyone in the room is not familiar with SMFM, it is our annual, probably preeminent conference for maternal fetal medicine. It's a big deal where the best of the best science is presented internationally. Folks come in, over 3,000 people attend annually, and we just had it maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago in San Francisco. The way this conference works, like many, is that you get something that looks like what the New York City telephone directory would have looked like at some point. It's massive, full of all of the abstracts, oral plenaries, and posters, just like any other scientific meeting, and they are numbered. There is a very set pattern to SMFM, which is Thursday morning at 8 a.m., the very best of the best international science, the most highly ranked abstract will be presented at 8 a.m. and will be given the coveted number, abstract number one. I'd like you to see who abstract number one was this year. It was the University of Wisconsin, and it was Dr. Aaron Bailey, who did not appear to be beta blocked or double beta blocked and presented herself and your program with extraordinary poise and confidence on the stage. She was an all-star and for that, she won the Norman F. Gant Award, which is best in class. So University of Wisconsin was essentially best of best at the international MFM show this year. There were a series of other oral presentations, um, participating in postgraduate courses and posters, but I wanted to lift up Dr. Bailey. I will tell you as a chair, I would not be a good chair if I did not look and see if she already had a job. And <laughs> it appears she's employed by you. So congratulations, Ellen, well done. Um, but you were well represented in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. Okay, objectives of my talk this morning. I will tell you the most common thing that happens when someone invites you to talk and says, I don't care what you talk on, you choose, is that you present on your research because it's an area that you have a lot of content expertise in, other people don't. You have slide decks that you've used for years and it's just a really easy kind of packaged product to bring. I will tell you I chose path B. I did not do that path this morning. I am presenting on something that I've actually not published on as of yet, but that we are deeply embedded in the work of this. And I'm doing it because I am showing up as an evangelist. I am showing up this morning to tell you about something that we who were trained in the germ theory of medicine get very little training in, and I believe has the opportunity to profoundly impact the lives of folks that we take care of. So what I'm going to do this morning is introduce you to a landmark study that was published in 1998. It's called the ACEs study. We're going to talk briefly about biologic plausible uh, theories for the relationship between childhood trauma and early mortality for adults. And we're going to consider the ways in which knowledge of ACEs may improve your clinical practice here in Wisconsin. There is no financial interest that I have in this topic, and I will not be discussing any medications. So I was a kindergarten teacher before going into medicine, and I have still uh, kind of mid-career, mid-life, still consider the opportunity to go back into uh, early childhood education as a as a potential path for myself. So we are going to do story time this morning, okay? We are going to sit and reflect on um, how the science is created, what's behind that kind of very dry piece of paper that you sit and read and highlight p-values. So this, much of this is taken from a series of interviews that are published there and the reference for you in case you want to look it up. But we're going to talk about the ACE study, which is the most important public health study you never heard of. And it had its origins in an obesity clinic on a quiet street in San Diego. So Kaiser Permanente in San Diego was best in class and remains this for many things, but best in class in the early 1980s in the field of preventive medicine. This was a field that was there in some of the Scandinavian countries in Europe that did not exist in the US. And they set up a department of preventive medicine there in San Diego. Every year, 50,000 people would come through the clinic. It was established in 1980 and they would get screened for every potential bio 
biomarker, anything that could be measured on a human being, they would get screened for and they would have prediction models run of how likely they are to have adverse health outcomes and they would be funneled to the right place to try to mitigate those adverse health outcomes. Well, why would that make sense? Well, it'd make a lot of sense if Kaiser was at risk for those lives, right? It would make a lot of risk if Kaiser was the insurance product that was covering those folks. And they said, let's get them upstream of the disease, screen them at this clinic, and we'll do it for free. So every year, 50,000 people in the community funneled through. That's extraordinary. That was 1980. This was well before we were doing this type of work now. It was well before the idea of um, value-based care was even being discussed. And this was was the guy that started it. His name is uh, Felidi, and he was really apparently this huge character in the community of deep respect. He cut an imposing yet dashing figure, tall, straight-backed, not a silver hair out of place, penetrating eyes. He was a doctor whom patients trusted implicitly, spoke of reverentially, and rarely called by his first name. Um, so what he does, Felidi, is he actually sets up within this space an obesity clinic, and that is going to be his number one book of business is this obesity clinic. Folks could go to it if they were trying to lose 30 pounds or more, but it was really geared towards folks who were trying to lose, as it says in the paper, 100 to 600 pounds of weight. And it was a very dedicated kind of obesity medicine clinic before the field of obesity medicine was what it is today. In 1985, he looked back over his records for the first five years, and he was distraught because he noticed that they had a 50% attrition rate from their clinic. 50% of patients would not come back, would drop out of the program. And so he did what any good researcher would do, which is to say, pause, let's look at that 50% that's not coming back and figure out what's different about them when compared to the folks who continue on. And as he went through it, what he assumed was that those were the folks who were not hitting their weight loss metrics, that those would be the folks who lost, who came out of the clinic. And what he found was not that. What he found was that those folks who came out of the clinic were as successful, if not more successful at weight loss by measure by aggregate weight reduction over the period and were leaving the clinic as they were losing weight. And he said, that makes no sense. And so he paused and set up a research study and investigation around those 283 humans that dropped out, called them and said, would you come back and let us do interviews? So he starts doing the interview process. You have a series of screening questions. He's walking through those. And I'm imagining much like probably many of you, I know I've done it many times when I'm going through a series of questions like a review of systems that has become rote, right? Where we don't really need our frontal lobes to help us process that. Um, much like that, he was asking a question, a series of questions and the questions he was trying to ask were, how old were you the first time you had sexual intercourse? But instead, what he said to a patient in front of him was, how much did you weigh the first time you had sexual intercourse? It was just, you know, you're asking a series of questions and he conflated some words. And she answered 40 pounds. And he paused and he said, I'm sorry, I misspoke. And he did it again. He ran the question again and she said 40 pounds. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong, but, but what do you mean? And she started crying and said, I was four years old it was my father and started crying. So he was arguably mid to later career at the time. He was highly decorated. He was kind of the head of this preeminent thing there. And he says that he thought back and he said, huh, I have been practicing for 23 years. And that is the second time in my career that I have found a case of childhood sexual assault. Second time. Is that prevalence normal? That's odd. So he asked the next couple of questions or patients on his schedule, a similar question, though not around weight, but what was the age of sexual debut? And he found an extremely high sexual abuse history in the group of people that he was studying who had left the clinic. He was worried that he was biasing the, the folks, the subject somehow. And so he actually asked five colleagues to come in and run the questions. They ran the questions and they said, yeah, we're finding it too. 
So he takes it to the North American Association for the Study of Obesity Medicine in Atlanta. He goes and he's really excited to present the work of these 283 patients and to say, I don't know what's going on, but I'm telling you there is a strong signal that's very unusual. He presented to a room that was extremely polite, doctors usually are, sat there quietly. And at the end, someone went to the microphone, to the podium and said, I think your patients are lying. I don't think that's right. I think that they are overstating their trauma. And um, it's, it's a common thing that we understand in medicine that patients will exaggerate their trauma to hide other problems around which they have shame. He goes to dinner that night, much like I got to go to dinner last night with three of your colleagues, and he's sitting at dinner and he's seated by this guy, David Williamson, who's a PhD epidemiologist at the CDC, and he is bummed. He's really sad. And he says, I really thought that we were onto something and I'm convinced we are, but there was no buy-in there. And the epidemiologist turns around, I imagine over cocktails, perhaps not, and says, they can ignore you with a sample size of a couple hundred but they couldn't with thousands of people. And they couldn't if it's not a subset of a group of people in an obesity clinic, but if it was a general population, right? What a good epidemiologist, go to a big population and see if that's true. Don't just measure it in this little niche group. And Felitti, knowing what he's sitting on at Kaiser says, not a problem. I've got that many people. Like I've got very easy access to that many people. So he gets introduced the next day to this gentleman, Robert Anda. Robert Anda is a medical epidemiologist. He is someone who trained in um, to practice medicine practice for just a few years and then went over to the CDC. And his interest was coronary artery disease and depression and hopelessness. He had found as in clinical practice, this association, he had observed it and wanted to test it. So went on board at the CDC to try to figure out how to do that. So this is a marriage of amazing minds that happens. And David Williamson is essentially the person who makes it happen. So Anda and Felitti are the names that you are putting into your story time memory. So this study was conceived by these two gentlemen. Um, it ran through the Kaiser Health Plan. Folks who had completed their standardized medical evaluations between August and November of 95 and January and March of 96 were eligible. One week after visiting the clinic, this thing that they called the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey was mailed to the patient's homes. There was a second mailing that went out for non-responders, and their response rate was extraordinary. It was over 70%. That's highly unusual. Right now, response rates are about 50%, and you have to have 50% to get into the green. You can't submit for a survey study without 50%, um, but 70% at this time is very high. So curious what happened to December, and when you go back and read it, they actually intentionally paused sending surveys in December because they said, folks don't respond as well to mail in December as they do in other months. And so they strategically dropped the month because they didn't want a lower response rate for their study. Really smart, a good epidemiologist. Um, so they sent it out to this huge group of people, 13,494, and they got over 9,000 responses. In order to create what is the ACEs survey, um, they did a deep dive in the literature around childhood abuse, and really it did not, um, it had not been codified in a way that we now understand it. What they came up with were three primary domains of adverse exposure that happened to you before you're 18. One of the domains is abuse, sexual, physical, or emotional. Another is neglect. And then the final is household dysfunction. So abuse has three questions, neglect has two, and household dysfun dysfunction has five. This is an iteration from a different version of the survey. The most commonly used now is a 10-question survey. I will invite all of you now, it will not offend me at all, if you want to pick up your phone and Google Google NPR ACE quiz. You can take the survey yourself. It may be triggering. It's a really quick, like 20, 30 second yes, no, and it will give you a score. The way your ACE score works is the score ranges from a possibility of zero to 10. You get one point for every yes answer. And it may be helpful as we talk for you to have your score in mind. Um, but also for many people, it can be a triggering experience. So as you wish with this. What they found with their original publication, and these folks were followed for 15 years longitudinally, is as demonstrated here. So first of all, you see the um, standard breakdown of characteristics of the study population, gender, age, race, ethnicity, and education. They had 8,000 folks in this sample size with the initial publication. 
the number of categories you see against the x-axis. So how many different aces out of a possible score of, I believe in this, it may have been 12. I can't remember. This was very early iteration. But how many of those, oh, they say seven individual categories were assessed. So how many did you score? Um, and the maximum was four or more in this space. Um, so you can see the prevalence of ACEs. So of the total cohort, one and two had no exposure to child or adverse childhood experiences, but one and two did. Another quarter had exposure to one, 12% to two, 6% to three, and or 7% to three, and 6% to four. So a pretty startling burden for a group of folks that said it's likely they're making this up. So it, it looked like in a very diverse, large cohort, folks said, no, we had it too. This now in 2023 may be less surprising. It was radical back then. People did not report their childhood trauma. We didn't have a way to quantify childhood trauma. It was something very private that wasn't discussed. So this was really groundbreaking. Anda has um, said that when the results of the survey were due to come in, he was at home in Atlanta. He logged into his computer at night and he wept. I saw how much people had suffered and I wept. This defied the expectations of folks who were doing the research. They next compared your ACE score, your total score, how many categories that the language they use then you had and what they describe as risky health behaviors. So considering yourself an alcoholic, ever using illicit drugs, injecting drugs, um, promiscuity as denoted by 50 or more intercourse partners and uh, an STI. What I want to draw your eyes to here, um, it's a lot for those of you in the back to read, but you're going to look at considers yourself an alcoholic. So alcohol use disorder in modern uh, parlance, number of categories. If you scored a zero, you were the referent and the prevalence of that for you was about 3%. If you had one adverse childhood experience, the prevalence almost doubled. The adjusted odds ratio was two being corrected for age, race, and educational attainment. The prevalence is now six. If you had two, it goes up to 10% prevalence, adjusted odds ratio of four. You go up to a three, you get a 4.9 adjusted odds ratio. And if you have a score of four or more, your risk of um, considering yourself an alcoholic is, or your likelihood is 7.4 times that of someone who had a zero. So for the young researchers in the room, what you'll see is what it looks like a dose dependent response in this space. It appears that the more I'm exposed to, the more yeses I put into that questionnaire, the higher the chance that I'm going to consider myself an alcoholic. Well, let's look. Does that continue on? Ever used illicit drugs? The adjusted odds ratio, 1, 1 1.7, 2.9, 3.6, 4.7. Absolutely. It, the trend is almost linear at that space, ever in dr injected drugs, you're tenfold more likely if you had a score of four or more. Promiscuity, um, 50 or more sexual partners, threefold more likely. And all of these, look at the confidence intervals, almost all of these are significant once you hit two. And STI, um, the absolute number is still positive, though the adjusted odds ratio is smaller. I would ask you to pause and think through what else has a dose dependent ratio, uh, dose dependent relationship with risky behaviors in this way. What other exposure could you consider that does that? So just something to think through as we go on. Now they looked at the major risk factors for long-term early mortality, preventable mortality, smoking, severe obesity, physical inactivity, depressed mood, suicide attempt, alcoholism, et cetera, et cetera. And they look at folks with the number of categories now on your y-axis and the number of risk factors. And what you will see over the course of the exposure now walking down is that those who have the highest number of categories that they responded yes to have the lowest chance of having no risk factors for these adverse outcomes and the highest chance of having many risk factors for adverse outcomes. Well, that's still just a mediator. We don't really care about the smoking. If smoking didn't hurt us, we wouldn't care. So what about the actual adverse outcome? And here it is. This is the 15-year follow-up, ischemic heart disease, cancer for the oncologist in the room, stroke, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and diabetes. 
uh, the signal around diabetes is less strong. In fact, it touches one and crosses one throughout, so we'll throw that out. Uh, but for ischemic heart disease, the prevalence of the disease based on the number of categories, 5.6% of folks with four or more ACEs has had ischemic heart disease during the time of the study course, and it doubled your lifetime risk for cancer, a 90% increase if you had four or more adverse uh, childhood experiences when compared to a referent with none, stroke 2.4 as the adjusted odds ratio. So there is a significant increased risk in actual morbidity that is measured by classic diseases that we're trained in if you had more trauma as an early child. We found a strong dose response relationship between the breadth of exposure to abuse or household dysfunction during childhood and multiple risk factors for several of the leading causes of death. These conditions, dot, 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 showed a graded relationship to the breadth of childhood exposures. These findings suggest that the impact of these adverse childhood experiences on adult health status is strong and cumulative. So I want you to hold on to that. Your exposure as a kid is impacting your long-term health as an adult, and that appears strong and cumulative. We'll get to the question of what about adult exposure to these things in just a second. So how, how would that work? What, what does that look like? So many folks have done some iteration of this uh, schema, and it is the working schema on how this might work. Your adverse childhood experiences, your ACEs, disrupt early neurodevelopment. They impact your social, emotional, cognitive impairment. Uh, you adopt inverse or adverse uh, health risk behaviors, including smoking, alcohol use, overeating, et cetera. That leads to disease and early mortality. But let's look and see if we can measure it. So this is a group that looked at biomarkers of adverse childhood experiences by way of systematic review published in 2018. And what they found is that early life adversity by ACE score was associated with alterations in the HPA and autonomic axes, that it uh, changed our circulating peripheral and central cortisol levels, and that we had significant changes in inflammatory markers, as we'll talk about in just a second. A reminder about allostatic load, it's something that we, we were taught early in our careers and don't think about all the time, but that is when our physiologic systems have adapted and adapted and adapted, and eventually lo they lose their ability to do so. That was the uh, premise that was suggested in 93 by McEwen and Steller. So the systematic review included 40 studies, ultimately. What they found by way of system for neuroendocrine markers, they had five studies that were included. They did, or I'm sorry, they had six studies included. Five of them demonstrated a decrease in salivary cortisol with higher ACEs. One study found an increase in salivary cortisol with higher ACEs, so mixed findings in that domain. For inflammatory markers, this is one of the most consistent pieces of the science. All 14 studies have showed a strong link between ACEs and circulating inflammatory markers in the adult state, interleukin-6, C-reactive peptide, and TNF-alpha being the most consistent. That makes sense for the obstetricians in the room. IL-6 is implicated in preterm birth um, and something that certainly um, we can extrapolate into our domain. Cardiometabolic markers were fairly consistent over 11 studies that showed a link between your ACEs and your blood pressure, your BMI, and your combined cardiometabolic risk score with your blood pressure, triglycerides, and waist circumference. And then genetic uh, biomarkers is a really interesting domain. So variable findings in this space in seven studies Three showed a link between ACEs and decreased telomere length. We're going to come back to that. One did not. But two studies demonstrated a very strong link between childhood sexual abuse, so a very particular ACE exposure, and methylation of the promoter region for 5-HTT for serotonin. That makes a lot of sense biologically. So a reminder for those of you in the room who haven't thought about telomeres in a while, of course, there are end caps. They're the non-coding part that sits on the end of the DNA that's protective. They do shorten each time we go through cell division, but they prevent the loss of important genetic information. So this study was really interesting, um, came out in 2018 or 19, 18, looking at telomere length and mitochondrial DNA copy number. And what they found was that um, there were significant differences in telomere length stratified by early ACE exposure 
and they say this is some evidence for the changes that happen at our cellular level that may predict later adverse outcomes. So they took two large samples from the UK and the US, each found a dose response, so more ACEs, shorter telomeres. That is wild. Again, I'd ask you to think through what other exposures would you have more of this consistent across populations in every domain other than the salivary cortisol and demonstrate the signal. Interestingly, this group did go back and look at adult exposure to adverse outcomes. So there's childhood experiences and ACEs, which is all childhood, and then said, but what if we control for adult or look at a population that's had adverse experiences of trauma as an adult? And neither of the studies could find a signal in that regard. Your adult trauma did not change your telomere length. Your childhood trauma did. Similarly, uh, lifetime stress was not associated with telomere length in a birth cohort study of Danish men, but their number of ACEs was a strong predictor of shorter telomeres. So what happened later doesn't appear to impact our telomeres the way that it does when we're kids. And finally, among combat exposed uh, male war veterans, ACEs, more than their PTSD from battle, negatively correlated with their telomere length. More than going to war, your score on an ACE test predicted your telomere length. There has been a little bit of work in the domain of prenatal stress as a very early ACE. Uh, Low-income Latinx cohort study looked at depression um, in kiddos, kiddos who were exposed to depression, maternal depression by age three, and they did have shorter telomeres when compared to a matched cohort with moms without depression at ages four and five. And then they did a similar study with young daughters of mothers with recurrent depression. So what about ACEs in Wisconsin? Are there data for you here? Yes, there are. So this is the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey. Data were done in many states, almost all states, in 2010. And then you've had an update, I believe, 2018 or 19. And this is the prevalence of ACEs here in Wisconsin. So uh, your team looked at eight questions instead of the standard 10. So the possible score here is smaller. But emotional abuse prevalence was almost 30%. So today, as you walk out, you see 20 patients. Statistically, six of them would have been exposed to emotional abuse as a child younger than 18. Substance abuse in the household, 27%. Separation divorce, 21%. And you can see the numbers going from there. So again, the prevalence is pretty high in a population here in Wisconsin. In this uh, survey, so they it's a phone survey that is done, um, they are uh, just a thousand data points that are collected, and they have examined total ACE exposure with adverse adult outcomes here in Wisconsin, and just to orient you, the green bar is going to be the referent of folks who have no exposure to ACEs. The red bar is I scored four or more, and then purple and orange in the middle. So when they ask the question, are you dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with life? The referent was 2%. So 2% of the people you encounter who have had no childhood adverse experiences are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with life here in Wisconsin. After walking around yesterday, I have to hypothesize that that number is lower than it might be in other places in the country. So your city is beautiful. Your state appears very beautiful. Perhaps that is even worse for those of us in other parts of the country. Who knows? As you have more exposure to child, uh, adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, that number goes up with 14% of folks who've had four or more saying they are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. Is it associated with receiving badger care, Medicaid? Yes. You can see a graded relationship there. With a diagnosis of depression? Yes. <laughs> with being a current smoker? Yes. So the prevalence of depression, lifetime prevalence for this cohort of folks with four more ACEs was 36%. ACEs and heavy alcohol use, looking at the difference between men and women. So on these axis, axes, they have dip oriented it in a different way. So number of ACEs is now on your X axis. And you see for men and women, a varying but increasing um, diagnosis of heavy alcohol use or self-report of heavy alcohol use that comes with more exposure to adverse childhood trauma, with bad mental health days, physical health, and what are called limitation days in the past month. So this is a snapshot of how do you feel right now? You can see a graded relationship. 
And then again, the dissatisfaction with life question in a different format. So I went on your um, your your health your DHS whatever is, is that what it's called here I'm trying to remember, um, but essentially your state health department looking for primary causes of death in reproductive age women in the state of Wisconsin and the most recent data that I could find from 2020 demonstrated that the top three causes of death are accidental poisoning and exposure to other noxious substances, substance use disorder right that's overdoses that's number one, MVAs and suicide. All three of those things, the most common causes, not of preventable death, but of death in reproductive age women, which is a lot of who we take care of in this room, are things that are heavily predicted by a single A score. Okay, so how likely is someone to have any of these things heavily predicted by an A score? So there is a group here who has made recommendations. So I believe this is part of the Children's Trust with the DHS um, recommendations that came out of their ACE work. The first or the third recommendation was to partner with the healthcare community to improve the integration of behavioral and primary health care and identify and promote strategies to essentially screen for ACEs and respond to ACEs. So that is a, a recommendation. And then the second, and this should catch your eye, is there's a recommendation that this be tied to reimbursement that this is something that is important enough that it should be integrated into value-based contracts and performance measures for forward health. So what is an OBGYN to do with all of this? So I would recommend that we do as we do with other key drivers of adverse health outcomes which is SBIRT, right? We, this is not new to us. We know how to do this. We screen a brief intervention and referral to treatment. That's not hard. That's not a lot for those of us who are trying to impact morbidity and mortality. So what would that look like? So first, you good users of Epic who are in the backyard, the literal backyard of the corporation will not be surprised to know that Epic has a thousand different ways to configure dashboards around ACEs for that to be a universal part of your screening process. So that is not going to require any extra lift other than deciding where you want it to go in your flow sheet. So this is easily automated and for researchers, it is easily pulled. I will tell you that this year, so ACEs have been slow to come into the work of um, OBGYN, at least to come into kind of a, a major space, though they have been out for a long time. Um, Dr. Emily Miller shared a, a podium or was close to Dr. Bailey on a podium. She was several numbers down that morning. I can't remember if she was four or five, but Dr. Emily Miller is an MFM who has been at Northwestern for a long time. I think she's at Brown now, but she is working on what she calls I believe a CCM, a collaborative care model for women um, and birthing people around the time of childhood for mental health needs, where she has collaborators in different disciplines. It's essentially a large, well-run, multidisciplinary uh, pathway for folks. And they began measuring ACEs in that cohort. And she presented, and again, this made the major plenary. This is something that a resident could have done this work. It was not a complex study design, but looked at the prevalence of ACE scores against the single question of suicidality. Have you considered suicide? Not attempts, those are very rare, right? That'd be hard to find an association there, but actual suicidality, have you thought about killing yourself? And what she found was a strong graded relationship with your ACE score and um, an adjusted odds ratio for ever suicidality that she presented with an adjusted odds ratio of seven for those folks who have a score greater than or equal to seven. I'll pause here and say a high score is considered four. I should have said that earlier. That is kind of the breaking point, though at every point there is attribution of additional risk, but a high score is considered uh, four. So for folks who reported for adverse childhood experiences, the adjusted odds ratio was five compared to those who had a score of zero for suicidality. The association um, by category was not different. So if you were exposed to abuse, neglect, or what she called household challenges because she didn't like the word household dysfunction, I support that. It was roughly the same adjusted odds ratios for each of those sat in the two domain. One of our residents um, did a study a few years ago trying to figure out where is the best place to ask these super personal questions 
like, how do we do it? And of course, like any good research after you do it, you do it differently the next time. And so this, I will say is not perfect, but the time we took 600, we have a high volume clinic and just over a period of short period of time, we did 600 ACEs and we divided that in three spaces. We won in the waiting room because that was most efficient for us. And we thought patients are bored. They're sitting out there, hand them a sheet of paper and iPad and like, let them answer the question. That's, you know, something to do with your hands while you're waiting. The second was in an exam room, either before, during, or after your visit. And then the third was in the postpartum space where you were delivered. You were on the other side of this event. And what she found was a significant difference in people's um, likelihood to both report and complete this, or likelihood to report ACEs, a lower ACE score reported in the waiting room than in the um, office setting or in the postpartum setting. So here we had a conversation last night about when and where do you ask the questions? And what I will say is that I, um, the more I think about this, the more I think that we can learn a lot about what we value and what we believe our roles to be by who we let do the measurement in our clinic and how much time we give to that. Screening for domestic violence is almost universal. I'm assuming here at Wisconsin, if I came in, there's a question, probably a PHQ-2 that someone's going to give me every single time I come in for care and they're going to code my PHQ-2 and say, yes, I referred out for treatment or not. And then someone's probably going to ask me about domestic violence. If not, we should. So that's going to be universal. And I would be willing to bet that if I went into any of your clinics, the person who's doing that, there's a decent chance that that person is an MA or a nurse who's rooming me and they're doing it by way of kind of quick efficiency in an Epic system while looking at a computer and clicking those zeros. Okay. That that's what happens on that scoring sheet. So that is not ideal for us to talk about things that are hard in our lives. We would never ask someone to do the intimate part of an exam as they're initially rooming a person and then say, now we're gonna pivot away because it's intimate, it's private. We save that part for the very end after establishing rapport. There are those of us that won't let a patient, that will offer the patient the opportunity to not get changed until we've established a relationship because we know that's a vulnerable moment for them. So to ask someone, for the first time in their life often to revisit their childhood trauma by an MA who's handing a survey and or worse yet, reading the questions off a screen and just yet, yeah, I just need a yes or no on these because I've got a lot of other patients we're trying to get through this big system. Um, not ideal. So my recommendation on this is that ACEs are driven by the provider. They're driven at the very end of a visit after someone is dressed again, they are safe and we're sitting down I really enjoyed the opportunity to meet you today. I really enjoyed the opportunity. There is a final set of questions that's pretty important that we are learning about that helps predict outcomes. And I would like to offer you the opportunity to do it. It's a little bit like getting a blood draw or having your blood pressure checked, but it's for um, the domain of adverse childhood experiences of things that happened to you before you were 18. Are you okay answering these? Consent and then engagement. So I would say it should not be anyone but the person who has the most trust um, has established, done the work to establish the trust with the patient. Another group of folks who looked at this and found that there were changes in ambulatory blood pressure in pregnancy associated with ACEs. My memory of this is that the changes were um, less diurnal variation. So folks were not becoming less hypertensive as they slept, that folks exposed to more ACEs continued to keep their blood pressure higher over time. So what is a brief intervention? This is something that comes up a lot in our work as we have embedded ACEs more globally. Um, it is not fully integrated across our system, but many of us are using them. So what is the intervention when someone tells you that they were raped as a child? What is the intervention when someone tells you that they, have, they grew up with an alcoholic parent or someone who emotionally abused them? Um, and here are some suggestions. I am not an expert in this domain again, but this, these are some of the things that I would consider that have been helpful for me. I'm incredibly sorry that happened to you. It's acknowledging it. It's truth and it's bad. And I'm sorry. Exposure to childhood trauma is very common. And then for you here in Wisconsin, data informed is more of us than not have been exposed when we were young. So if you look around as you walk out of our clinic, statistically, half of all the people you see had something happen, have a score, you're not alone, right? Normalizing it. Let me introduce you to this metric and let's use it as a source of power, right? We wouldn't check someone's blood pressure and not tell them. We wouldn't check their triglycerides and not tell them. So here's your ACE score. This is what it is. Go read about it. 
referral for treatment. So the antidote, as the research would suggest to the trauma, is resilience. It's work around um, the mitigating some of the effects. Now, if your telomeres are shorter by age four, if you're exposed to depression at three, I don't know how you mitigate telomere length, but there are a lot of good cognitive behavioral therapy modalities that have been shown to increase resilience and decrease some of those, the prevalence of those mitigating risk factors. So the smoking, the overeating, what uh, inactive lifestyle, suicidality, et cetera. And here are some of those here available for you. So um, I'm hoping this map means more to you than it does to me geographically that these points are known to you, but here are some of the places that offer support by way of uh, um, resilient Wisconsin. Nurse Family Partnership is an extraordinary model of leveraging two additional years of in-home support for women who are vulnerable by virtue of being their first pregnancy and being on Medicaid. And here are all of your NFP offices. Um, and of course, there is the opportunity for trauma-informed care. So if this is not part of your faculty development, your resident education all the time, it really should be. We're better providers when we know how to do this. I would say we're better surgeons when we know how to do this. Um, and they talk about the four R's here in the space. So realizing the prevalence of trauma, recognizing how it affects individuals, responding by putting the knowledge into practice, and then resisting the re-traumatization. So um, here are some resources for you unique to Wisconsin. There is a wonderful training video that exists here from your Department of Health Services, um, and I embedded this not to show you the video, of course, but to show you the link in case anyone is interested in doing some work themselves and improving their training in this domain. And then finally, referral uh, for treatment being very specific uh, around mitigating the effects. So what the kind of conclusion of much of this work has been is that yes, ACEs are pervasive, long-term health impacts are real. It is a very serious health, public health concern. And while it does increase our vulnerability to a disease, it does not have to predetermine our health trajectory. And so trauma-informed intervention is prudent. Thank you for having me. These are two of my favorite people that I know in Wisconsin. If anybody has access to Giannis, I'm looking for a jersey today for my 12-year-old and myself. I'm hoping he's recovering well there outside of Milwaukee. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And resident researchers, we celebrate you today. We celebrate the fact that doing research during your residency is akin to running a marathon and also learning Russian, learning to speak Russian as you're running. Like you're running this marathon and all of your body is just trying to survive but then you're also doing Duolingo and trying to retain Russian. So well done just for making it to today. Thank you. That was amazing. Oh, sweet. Thank, you. Thank you. That was amazing. I've, I don't know about you, but I've, I've learned a lot. I think we've, we've, we've started this, uh, or I've started a journey learning a lot more about trauma-informed, which certainly I didn't learn in medical school. And yeah. I think it's it's certainly very powerful. So with that, we are happy to take questions. Um, and I will be uh, reading the chat. Um, just a reminder, uh, the uh, code for this morning is H-E-H-R-E-R. Again, H-E-H-R-E-R. -E Thank you so much for that talk. That was fantastic. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Um, it's really interesting because we don't have a systematic way of screening for IPV um, in OBGYN and I believe in UW Health as a whole. So our clinical ops committee is actually working on this right now and the system as a whole as well. And so the system-wide launch maybe a little bit further down the road, but we kind of have the opportunity to possibly jumpstart that in OBGYN and be like a front runner in our system. And I'm just thinking about, we actually just had a meeting where we talked all about how do, where are we going to put these questions for IPV? And we decided, okay, the providers need to do that, but then there's obviously all the challenges that come along with that. I'm wondering in your spaces, do you couple your IPV questions with your ACE questions and do you do like a, that whole 10 question screener or a portion and in your prenatal care, where do you stick that? Just curious how your system is running. Yeah. 
Um, so thank you for the question. And let me say that I do not want to falsely suggest more un uniformity of practice around this than we have. So let me not uh, speak as though we're all just flying great with this and our systems are really slick because they are not right now. Um, we are on EPIC and we are an entirely employed medical group. So our department has 15 practices and divisions and we have 120 physicians and midwives. So it is a, a big group with lots of different offices where people are delivering care. And there is within each of those some variation in workflow that has been allowed to be specific to the needs and flow of a clinic. Um, and whether or not that's good or bad, it's part of the legacy of bringing lots of groups of people together with lots of opinions and the slow march towards uniformity. So let me pause on that. What I will say around ACES, so we're using the 10 question survey, yes, we are using it in two formats. There is a paper version that we can then translate into EPIC for folks um, where we feel like there is vulnerability and that would be most helpful. There is an iPad version, well, I guess there are three versions, and then there's just the standard EPIC um, entry by someone else. We tend to use the iPad or the paper and the iPad goes directly into their EPIC portal. So that's that piece. The IPV question we are still moving around as well, the ask in our training training program is that for all of us in the academic side that that question comes from physicians or midwives from someone at the end of an exam um, and it would be a great screening question or a QI for us to pull the numbers and see make sure that we are screening and documenting in that domain. I think optimal flow for you know, so what is the problem? Well, the problem is that we have designed our medical system, at least me, this is my diagnostics, around visits that assume good health and assume a very narrow scope of focus of what I'm allowed to do with you during that. And that's, you know, new to no one. If we do the math on how much time I could actually spend face to face with a patient, you know, not considering documenting, it's so narrow that the idea of anything being added to our plate during that just, we bulk because it feels, impossible. And it is. But I would say that blood pressure measurement, that uh, ACE score, depression screening, and IPV should all be towards the end of a visit. But that, that that's the patient-centered approach, right? Like coming into a healthcare system is so anxiety provoking. It makes me nervous when I'm on the patient side. And I've spent all my life in hospitals. My mom's a nurse and she was a single mom. So I was grew up spending the night up on the cancer floor all the time. She was a night nurse and that's what we did. And it was the eighties and they did not regulate very well. Um, but my entire life has been spent in that. But the moment the story flips and I'm taking care of my mom or my dad in a hospital, I am nervous. I can feel it. Like if I do a scan of my body, my belly is a little bit anxious and I'm a little sweaty. So if that's my story, I have to imagine it is for other people. And I do believe that our blood pressure readings are not accurate for a lot of folks for that reason, that if we gave them just a moment to not be acutely scared, it's a more gentle approach. So anyway, I would say towards the end of a visit and the systems approach is you have to give a few more minutes, give, give five more minutes, give three more minutes. Now, how that translates to a system bottom line is extraordinary. Three more minutes for every visit. Folks, I mean, you know, all the good consulting agencies can tell you exactly what that does to revenue and flow and access and all of those issues. So it's a problem, but I think it's the ethical approach. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm loving the box that gets passed around y'all. We, no. we do not have that and it's amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. I, I never screened for this formally, but I, you know, sometimes in talking to patients, has anyone ever tried to harm you? This comes up and more often than not people's response when I try to kind of probe if they want resources is that they just like don't want to unpack it. So if people are not taking you up on an offer to go forward with some kind of intervention, is there something else that you do to kind of keep that on your radar or is it just kind of like we did this and then we moved on? Yeah. So um, great question. I wish I were further down the line so I could tell you what I actually do, but I'll tell you what I think we should do. Okay. So to me, the moment when someone says, no, I don't want anything, that's an opportunity. It's an invitation to curiosity for you as their healthcare partner to say, I wonder why that is. I wonder why it is. And the curiosity moment is the most telling pause that we can do, which it, reflecting on why would someone not, what are the stories we could create that would help, that would make someone not want to pursue treatment for that. One would be that 
it is distant and has been boxed away. And I believe that I've developed adaptive habits over time that have overcome my childhood traumas. I will tell you, my, my score is three. So it's pretty high. And this makes me a little bit antsy. So one would be to say, well, I'm highly functional. I think I'm pretty adaptive. I don't have any adverse, you know, I drink Diet Coke, but otherwise I think I'm pretty healthy. So that would be one response. Um, another would be shame around these things, right? Things are done to you because you deserve them. That narrative that is pervasive in early abuse. And so what I would do in that setting, I think is treat it just like someone who is diagnosed with hypertension, but doesn't want an agent diagnosed with hypercholesterolemia, but says, I don't want a statin, which is to say, I hear you on that. Let me um, share with you a few resources, read this, you know, take them to the Wisconsin website or take them to some of these articles. Why don't we do this? Why don't you read about this and learn about it? Because it's super normal. And the data, as much as I hate it, feel pretty compelling. And then see after that, if you're interested in doing anything in any of these spaces, allow them the invitation to learn more. And then I would put it on the problem list. I would consider that, right? And a score of seven, like that is more predictive than any cholesterol level, than any blood pressure. Like that is highly predictive and we should know it. We should think about it. And we should talk about it as one of our numericity pieces. You know, the numbers we use to define a human. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Patanker said, thank you so much for the talk. It was fascinating and eye-opening. There's data on in utero exposures to stress and incidence of adult onset disease, the so-called um, Barker uh, hypothesis. I'm wondering if there is data on patients who experience childhood trauma and stresses in utero, and if that combined trauma makes the outcome even worse. That's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. So Dr. Patel, or I'm sorry, Dr. Patanker, I'm sorry. I would say, um, Beautiful question, and I'm curious with you as well. I don't know. Again, I come to you. I wish I was an expert in this. I come to you as someone who has found something wonderful that I think we all need to explore, but I don't have expertise in that. It certainly makes sense. I will also pivot and tell you another question that I have as someone who lives in the deep American South and for whom that is really a mission field and for whom um, I'm living in the state that in 1860 had the highest percentage of it of population in the nation enslaved during that time. Um, more than half of our population was enslaved. So I think about racial trauma over time and how we think of all of these things in medicine as discrete buckets. There's early childhood trauma, these ACEs, and then there's all of the work that we're doing or needing to do around exposure to racism as a source of toxic stress. But all of these things are happening at the same time in reality, right? Humans aren't existing in these buckets. And so what is the science around integrating exposure to racial trauma or gendered trauma or war in early childhood experiences. This was tested in a population of pretty wealthy, pretty white people in San Diego during the 80s before the massive obesity epidemic that we have now, before the massive substance use disorder epidemic that we have now. So there's a lot of work to be done to see, does this look or perform differently in populations exposed to racism and in different geographic spaces as well. All right, if there's no uh, other questions, um, I'll read the last one on the chat and then we'll move on. Um, Heidi Jensen said, reason for not wanting treatment could be that it would be too disruptive to the patient's life that is facing the reality. Exactly. <clears throat> yep. So, amen. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. This was absolutely eye-opening.